This is like no other TV story. It's Jimmy's story. Inside the walls of St. James's Hospital, there unfold stories of real life and death drama, of doctor's skills, patient's fortitude, and of the strength and courage of ordinary people. Sundays at 7.15 on Central, Jimmy's. It's a tonic just to watch. Sundays at 7.45 on Central, step into the countryside with Forever Green, starring John Alderton and Pauline Collins. Now, you know the drill. First sign of a wheeze, you tell the teacher and she can find us. It looks like an unexpected guest is about to descend on the Bolt family. Forever Green, Sunday drama at 7.45 on Central. Just a reminder that our date with the ladies of cell block H is at 11.20 tonight. You're watching Central, now the national and international news from ITN. fighters in the desert. UN demands action to protect foreigners trapped by Iraq. New advice for the British, don't obey the order to move. Salman Rushdie film will be shown after censor lifts the ban. And inflation misses 10%, but only just. Good evening. The United Nations tonight expressed grave concern and anxiety about the fate of foreigners trapped in Kuwait and Iraq. The Security Council, responding to pressure from Britain, is asking UN Secretary General Perez de Cuella to take whatever action necessary to ensure their safety. Earlier today, the Foreign Office reversed its advice to the 4,000 Britons in Kuwait. It's now told them to ignore Iraqi orders and stay at home. In Moscow, the Soviet leader Mr Gorbachev said the Gulf crisis was now endangering the whole world. Tonight's news at 10 comes live from Desmond Hamill in the United States and from Sandy Gaul, who's in the Jordanian capital, Amman. But first, a report from our diplomatic editor, Edward Sturton, in London, who's been looking at the first pictures of British jet fighters on the ground in Saudi Arabia. They lie under their hangars in the desert, a squadron of Royal Air Force tornadoes. They're protected because the heat can damage the engineering. These first pictures of British forces in Saudi Arabia are a reminder that the military build-up now has a momentum of its own, whatever the diplomatic moves underway at the United Nations. Close by, Saudi Arabia's air power is in evidence, hawks built by British aerospace. And behind them, the silhouettes of American F-111 fighters. The Americans have brought their troop-transporting helicopters, their helicopter gunships, and at this Saudi base, three nations are mobilizing to face a common foe. The supplies have come in from the United States by giant galaxy transporters. The pilots and ground staff have been working constantly to make them ready. Along the brow of this hill, rapier missile defenses, a critical British contribution to this effort. American Marines drive heavy diggers towards the border it's this unprecedented build-up that the Iraqis now use to justify their treatment of Western civilians. In the desert, a reminder that many have had to abandon this area. And here, what Britain and America have promised to defend, the Saudi border with Kuwait. Sand dunes and a small fence are all that divides the Iraqi occupying army from the Western and Arab task force. It's here that war could begin. The Foreign Secretary today cited the deployment of British forces as evidence of Britain's determination. He'd returned to Whitehall after a brief break to be faced with the fear that British citizens in the Gulf are at risk. I think that we will have a good many alarms and different stories on this subject as day follows day until they're finally safely extricated, such as we had uh, yesterday. And I think we need to be very clear and steady about what is involved. Uh, the aim of the Iraqis, I suspect, is to weaken the determination, not just of ourselves, but of the Americans and of others, uh, and to use citizens, our citizens, uh, to this end. That, of course, is the tactic of the outlaw down the ages. It won't have that effect, and I think this will gradually uh, become clear. Uh, 
determination, instead of being weakened, will be strengthened. When British citizens in Kuwait reported to this hotel, the Regency Palace, last night, acting under an Iraqi threat of unspecified trouble if they didn't, they found no one there to receive them. British diplomats have spent all day trying to find out what the Iraqis were up to. We are concerned about them. Uh, they are treated very well. And they will leave uh, Kuwait City when everything is settled. But from the British Embassy in Baghdad came more disturbing indications of Iraq's attitude towards foreigners. Consular officials there were for the second time barred from the Mansour Hotel where a group of British servicemen are held. The Americans are having the same trouble establishing contact with some of their nationals who are held at another hotel. An American journalist's efforts to find them with a video camera ended when Iraqi security men caught him. But the first pictures of life in a Baghdad faced with the fear of a new war have reached London. The scenes on the streets suggest little out of the ordinary. But the military presence is very much in evidence. And reports say that the anti-aircraft batteries that were installed to protect the city during the Iran-Iraq war are manned 24 hours a day. And these images from Iraq are a reminder that Saddam Hussein has sacrificed the spoils of that war to concentrate his energies on his western front. Iranian POWs on their way home to a nation the Iraqi leader hopes will now become his ally against the West. Today's session at the United Nations was held behind closed doors, but after meeting for more than an hour, members were unanimous in their call for action to safeguard foreigners trapped in Iraq and Kuwait. Desmond Hamill is in Washington now. Here in the United States, the UN Security Council has duly expressed its concern and anxiety over the British and American detainees. And they put pressure on the Secretary General, Perez de Cuellar, to take appropriate action. Even the New York traffic couldn't stop Britain's UN ambassador today, Sir Crispin Tickle, jumping from his armour-plated rolls in mid-gem, hurrying to a series of meetings about the crisis. The day began with a meeting of the Sanctions Committee, which came to no positive conclusion. Then a meeting of EEC ambassadors. They talked over a plan to send a UN envoy to Iraq. That's a plan the Iraqis have already rejected. This afternoon, there was a special meeting of the Security Council, an informal meeting called by Britain to discuss the plight of British, American and other nationals detained in Iraq and Kuwait. The Security Council's informal talks produced a low-key result a request that the Secretary-General do all he could to resolve the situation. Well, it's for the Secretary-General now, who is the, who is the person who is responsible, and we're, we're hoping now he'll be able to make contact with the government of, uh, of Iraq to secure the release of these, um, of these unfortunate citizens. Only one problem, Mr. Perez de Quer isn't even in the United Nations headquarters this week. He's at home in Peru as part of a South American tour. If it's been a day of more talk than action at the United Nations, then that simply reflects the mood here. People are unsure what to do for the best, and fearful that any action they take from here can only exacerbate an already dangerous situation. And with that in mind, you won't find anybody here yet prepared to refer to those people held against their will as hostages. Ken Reese, News at 10, at the United Nations. The Pentagon has just announced that two American warships have intercepted two Iraqi ships moving towards Iraq off the coast of Kuwait. The two ships were empty and they were not boarded by the Americans. By early this morning, an armada of American warships had thrown a radar fence across the mouth of the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. They were under orders from President Bush to use force, if necessary, to stop any goods going into or coming out of Iraq. Two aircraft carriers and another 20 warships are on station in this region ready to challenge any suspicious cargo ships or oil tankers. President Bush himself was out on the golf course today near his holiday home in Maine. He insists the American naval blockade is legal, although no other countries have formally joined the maritime blockade, and the United Nations Security Council has not yet authorized the use of force to back the sweeping sanctions against Iraq for which it has already voted, a point made by the Secretary General. Until that is the case, all intervention by any member nation would not abide by the text or spirit of the United Nations Charter. Meanwhile, American television has been showing the troops in Saudi Arabia in good spirits. Yeah. 
and showing some of them relaxing in the aircraft hangars which have become their temporary home. They might be far away, but the familiar scenes of America are all round them. And all the time, the unmistakable signs that show these troops are planning to stay for a long time. Each day, more machines and weapons make their position more secure. But is it enough to deter Saddam Hussein from ordering an attack? All they do is they send it to me, and every day I have to ask, what will I do if he attacks tonight? And based on that, I take what I have in country, build a plan, and then we look what we're going to have the next night, the next night, the next night, so that it's all relevant. The cost of all this is high. By the end of September, the figure will be $1.2 billion. But President Bush is still hoping that isolating Iraq by sanctions and a naval blockade will prove to be the key to solving the problem. That's all from the United States. Over now to Sandy Gall, live from Jordan. Today being Friday, a holiday, things seem pretty normal in Amman. But as King Hussein flew back from America, there have been lots of political demonstrations up and down the country, all pledging support for President Saddam of Iraq. Bill Neely reports. The American flag was burned again tonight amid furious protests in the Jordanian capital. Support for King Hussein, Saddam Hussein and the PLO's Yasser Arafat is solid. The Iraqi ambassador to Jordan told the crowd that unity would bring victory. King Hussein returned from Washington to warm embraces this morning, but he made no public decision on the choice that faces him. Support Baghdad or join the Baghdad blockade. At Friday prayers, Jordan's spiritual leaders offered their choice. The Americans were desecrating Islam's holy places. They should be destroyed. The first scheduled flight to leave Baghdad for Jordan since the invasion brought news today of Americans and Britons still stranded in Iraq. They are living normal life. They are not allowed to leave the country, but they are living normal life. Are they hostages? No, 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 not at all. Thousands of foreigners, though, continue to flee Baghdad. Egyptians cramming cars and lorries with all they own to escape what they believe is an imminent war. But they arrive in a country close to ruin. Uh, investor confidence in Jordan is, is, has collapsed for the moment. So Jordan is on the verge of an economic catastrophe. Salvation for these demonstrators is to fight America. Many today joining the tens of thousands of Jordanians who've signed up for the Iraqi army. There's no easy way forward for King Hussein. The time for another diplomatic initiative is running out, and today's demonstrations will have reminded him that complying with United Nations sanctions against Iraq will be a difficult and dangerous step. Bill Neely, News at 10, Amman. The King was reported to be resting today after his long flight from America, but the word is already going around here that he has taken the plunge over sanctions against Iraq. Insiders said they found significant the King's remark in America that he now understood President Bush's position much more clearly. It meant, they said, that the King was in no doubt the United States meant business and that in the long run, President Saddam of Iraq was doomed. What are the King's options? He had been torn between his loyalty to Saddam, whom he admires as the most potent Arab leader since President Nasser of Egypt, with the guts to stand up to Israel, and his need to remain on good terms with the West. But he's now come to the conclusion that Saddam will collapse one way or the other, possibly in an army coup, and he cannot afford to let Jordan go down with him. His prime responsibility is to his own country, and so he's now backing away from the precipice. Of course, he cannot come out and say it. The country is still behind Iraq and deeply hostile to the American intervention in the Gulf. In the days and weeks ahead, the King will spread the message, addressing Parliament, possibly going on television, talking to the media, and pressing for a diplomatic solution. In other words, he'll play for time, massaging opinion at home to accept the inevitable. Earlier today, I asked Crown Prince Hassan, who ran the country during the King's absence in America, if Jordan will now apply UN sanctions against Iraq. Jordan, from the outset, uh, accepted the mandatory resolution, recognizes its responsibilities. The fact is that uh, Jordan uh, stands to suffer enormously, probably the, the uh, single party, to uh, uh, suffer whatever it does economically in terms of this uh, current uh, crisis. 
little people are going to be hurt all over Jordan and all over the occupied uh, uh, territories. And uh, yes, of course, the movement of uh, trucks is being wound down. As His Majesty said, shipments are being uh, uh, are uh, winding down. But the problem remains uh, effectively. This, this is not really a question of dollars and cents for us. There is tremendous public opinion. Public opinion is strong and limits the king's room for manoeuvre. The place that will suffer most from sanctions is, of course, Aqaba, from where Brent Sadler sends this report. The port of Aqaba, Baghdad's last trade route to the outside world, was physically coerced into obeying sanctions by US naval patrols around the Gulf of Aqaba. Only one ship, non-Iraqi, was preparing to unload today. Port operations have declined drastically all week and are expected to drop even more, hitting not only one of Iraq's vital import and export links, but Jordan's as well. Since uh, the situation uh, in Aqaba, there's no more, no more ships now. Shipping sources confirm that cargo traffic is at a virtual standstill, regardless of whether goods were destined for Iraq or were legitimate Jordanian imports. It has touched off a new wave of anti-Western rage. Surfacing immediately after Muslim prayers, when the people of Aqaba began expressing their anger. Iraq is not alone. Everybody in this world, in this world, in the Arab world, follows Saddam Hussein and King Hussein. We agree with that. We agree with that. The Aqaba Baghdad lifeline will run for as long as the trucks have goods to haul, perhaps just a matter of days. The jobs of more than 20,000 lorry drivers were immediately under threat. There are fears the Jordanian economy may collapse as a result of the action on Aqaba. These haulage workers said that if they can't help feed Iraq, they would fight instead against America, against Britain, for Saddam Hussein. Aqaba does not feel or look like a town under any form of siege. It is a tourist resort, and people, mostly foreigners, are relaxing normally, carefree and oblivious to Aqaba's role in the surrounding crisis. Tonight, there is calm in the harbor, Aqaba is the economic lung of Jordan, and if the stranglehold on Iraq suffocates a man, the calm could break. Brent Sadler, News at 10, Aqaba. So Jordan waits anxiously for the crisis to unfold. From Amman, back to you, Julia, in London. Here, a film portraying the British author Salman Rushdie as a torturer and a killer is to be released as a home video after all. The censor lifted his ban after an appeal which the writer himself supported, a report in part two. Plus, the white backlash interrupts South Africa's president. And Cram can't find winning form even in front of his home crowd. That's in a couple of minutes. There is a food made in plants from the sun's rays, which has grown on Earth for a hundred million years. It's a pure source of food energy. Its taste tells us when something is right. It forms part of the natural diet of virtually every creature, from the smallest to the greatest. It's one of the fuels for life itself. In what form do we know this food best? Sugar. If you want an impartial opinion on who's got the best football team, you don't ask a football team manager. If you want impartial advice on how to vote at the next election, you don't ask a politician. And if you want impartial advice on all the pensions around, you don't ask someone who works for a pension company. You go to NetWest. We've no pensions of our own to offer, just impartial advice on everyone else's. We're the only major high street bank who do this. So, for hard facts and no hard sell, have a natter with NatWest. A step-by-step -step guide to quality prints. One, take a holiday. Two, capture those unforgettable moments. Three, come home, needing a holiday. Four, enter boots and hand over film. 
Five, kill an hour while our experts do the rest. Six, collect hand-checked prints. Seven, impress your colleagues. If you want quality prints developed in an hour, step into boots. Once you put this on, it's on for years. No other well-known exterior paint will look as good as long. That's the ICI acrylic in it. Goes on smooth. Seems to shrug off weather. And if the job's worth doing, Dulux Weather Shield. It'll be years before he needs a new coat. Censors have lifted a ban on the controversial film International Guerrillas which portrays the author Salman Rushdie torturing and killing Muslims. They gave it an 18 certificate for home video showing after Mr Rushdie himself appealed against the original ban. The film depicts Salman Rushdie as a murderer and a sadist. He's hunted by three Islamic warriors and is finally struck down by a divine thunderbolt. It was banned after advice there was a prima facie case of criminal libel. But today's ruling means the video can now be hired or sold to adults. Salman Rushdie, who's still in hiding after the death threats, says the film is a piece of trash, but nevertheless welcomes today's ruling. Mr Rushdie doesn't believe in prior censorship. He's long been a campaigner against censorship in this country and for free expression. People have lost sight of that in the last two or three years with all this fuss over the satanic verses. But he's campaigned for many years on censorship issues. And he, doesn't, he didn't see the point of banning this film. I don't think he feels particularly threatened by this film. This film is slightly insulting, perhaps, but he's big enough to take care of that. The film's producer and distributors emerged from the appeal committee, claiming the ruling was a victory for British justice. They say there's already a big demand from Muslims for the video, which is in Urdu. A version with English subtitles is being planned for distribution to video shops around the country. The man accused of abducting seven-year-old Gemma Lawrence from a West Country caravan park escaped briefly from police custody today. Paul Burton was recaptured within a few minutes after being chased through the streets of Weymouth in Dorset. He's due to appear before the town's magistrates again tomorrow, charged with Gemma's abduction. Increasing gloom over the Gulf crisis sent shares tumbling today, wiping almost £10 billion off the value of companies. The FTSE 100 index ended down 45 points at 2176.9. The pound climbed to its highest level against the dollar for eight years, but closed at $1.9150, up two cents. In New York tonight, the Dow Jones closed down 36 points at 2644.8. Inflation in the year to July was 9.8%, unchanged on the previous month but higher petrol prices are expected to push the rate into double figures within weeks. Fresh fruit and vegetable prices usually fall at this time of year. Last month they were significantly lower and that staved off 10% inflation for another month. But the underlying rate of inflation, after taking out mortgages and poll tax, rose a little as cost pressures continue to build up. A packet of Safeway's wheat bisques costs £1.33. It's gone up 8% over the last year. 60% of the price covers manufacturer's costs, raw materials and wages, 10% transport and distribution charges, and 30% profit split between Safeway and its suppliers. The company says these cost increases are likely to accelerate. We do see inflationary costs coming in, especially from factors like the drought, and also increased distribution costs from petrol rising. Shell's raised petrol prices again today, leaving a gallon of four-star 15 pence more expensive than it was before the invasion of Kuwait. So the next inflation figures, which were expected to be above 10%, will be even worse. The rate will go higher, and in the next month's figures it's likely to be something like 10 and a quarter percent, possibly moving to 10.5% in the late summer. Labour says there can be no excuses for British price inflation. It doesn't matter how you measure inflation, whether you measure it on the orthodox RPI basis or on any of the government's fiddled alternatives to it, it, it remains depressingly high and much higher than competitors who live in exactly the same world as we do. 
the financial markets had little time to focus on the inflation figures, share prices plunged. Dealers hate uncertainty, and that's exactly what the Gulf crisis is creating. In South Africa, gangs armed with guns and spears clashed again in Soweto and other black townships. The tribal violence between supporters of the ANC and Zulu migrant workers has now claimed more than 180 lives. The people of Soweto begin to mourn as the bloody toll continues to mount after yet another night of violence. Hundreds have gone missing in the fighting and for residents today the horrific task of checking the identity of each body. Late last night, Police Minister Adrian Flock travelled to Soweto for an urgent meeting with ANC leader Nelson Mandela. We also appeal to the residents as well as uh, to members of other organizations who are involved in this conflict to settle down. We are uh, embarking on this road because we are extremely concerned about the safety and security of the inhabitants and the people of Suwete. But the government has problems in its own constituency as well. Last night, President de Klerk looked on as right-wingers broke up a meeting he was due to address. As police attempted to eject the hecklers, a tear gas canister was thrown. The meeting continued outside with an impassioned plea for unity. We must find a way in this country, as blacks and as whites and as coloured and as Indians, to live together in peace because we will continue to need each other now and in 10 years' time and in 50 years' time and in 100 years' time. But there was no sign of emergent unity in Soweto today. Even as further peace talks got underway, the fighting between opposing political and tribal factions continued unabated. Mike Hanna, ITN, Soweto. Here there was a setback tonight for Steve Cram's hopes in the European Athletics Championships in 10 days' time. He was outrun in the 1,000 metres by two teenage competitors at his home stadium in Gateshead. But Peter Elliott, the Commonwealth 1,500 metres champion, feared, fared much better. Steve Cram's disappointing season continued tonight. With the European Championships just over a week away, he needed the confidence booster of a win in front of his home crowd. It looked promising on the final bend, but once again the familiar kick for the line failed to materialise. He was caught by the Kenyan Johan Beria's storming finish. He ended up third, looked drained, but sounded optimistic. It wasn't a bad performance, as I said, and, and a little bit more strength than the last 50 yards. I would have won, and we'd all be seeing Steve Cram's back and all that sort of thing. I'm on my way back, you know, I'm not quite there yet. But no last-minute problems for Peter Elliott. Before tonight, he hadn't raced for almost five weeks, but he confirmed his return to form, easily winning the mile against a mediocre field. Now cricket, and in the second NatWest Trophy semi-final, Lancashire beat Middlesex by five wickets in the rain-delayed match at Old Trafford. Lancashire now meets Northamptonshire in the final at Lords on September the 1st. And finally, tonight's main news again. The United Nations Security Council has unanimously expressed its concern for the foreigners trapped in Kuwait and Iraq. Its members have asked the UN Secretary General to take urgent action on their behalf. Here, the Foreign Office has reversed its advice to the British in Kuwait, telling them not to obey Iraq's order to move. In the last half hour, the Pentagon has announced that two US warships have intercepted two Iraqi vessels moving towards Iraq off the coast of Kuwait. The Iraqi ships were found to be empty and were not boarded by the Americans. And here, censors have lifted the ban on a video portraying Salman Rushdie as a torturer and a killer. Well, that's all from us for tonight. Good night. Good evening. Well, it might be the middle of August, but the weather's pretty unseasonal at the moment. In fact, it hardly comes as a surprise to learn the football season gets underway tomorrow. Now, if you're lucky enough to escape these shores and you're off on your travels, then you are indeed much better off because the traditional European holiday hotspots 
indeed do remain hot, very far removed from this dark, thick, swirling cloud, bubbling off into the Atlantic and setting the scene for a none too pleasant weekend ahead for us. Now, as far as southern Europe goes, well, the catchwords are dry, hot, sunny, baking temperatures around the Mediterranean, sizzling past the 30 mark. The only problem might well be the Adriatic, prone to just a few thunderstorms. Well, southern Europe might well boast good holiday-like weather. As for southern Britain tonight, we can expect more than a few quite heavy outbreaks of rain as that rain and cloud continues to push eastwards. The north, in fact, will be much drier, but temperatures not quite so mild, round about the 7 degrees mark. We go into tomorrow and we continue on that unsettled theme. North Wales, across to the Midlands, down south, a thick grey veil of cloud, an overcast day, far more putri cloud, particularly around the coast. The north does in fact get a much better deal, if not a brighter deal. There will be a few sunny intervals and much lighter showers. Now then, looking even further ahead to Sunday, and as you can see, it's quite a grey, rainy, wet picture. Some particularly heavy bouts of rain are expected. But it's not all gloom and doom. There is much brighter weather just tucked in behind that. Now, as far as those temperatures go, in spite of all, fairly respectable, 20 mark down south, more like 17 further north. Let's hope things improve for the next bank holiday weekend. I'll leave you with tomorrow's summary. Good evening and welcome to Central News in the East Midlands. The latest escapee from Kuwait says other Britons may risk their lives and make a bid for freedom. Yeah. This was the moment Christine Bunting and her 13-year-old daughter Sandra knew their family ordeal had ended. Nottinghamshire engineer Peter Bunting was home from what he calls the harrowing experience of Kuwait. Well, I think it's grave at the moment. We can't trust this man, this, this time, at all. That's why we decided we should go, because, you know, it looks as though it's going to get worse instead of better for us. The 49-year-old engineer was part of a multinational convoy which crossed the desert to Saudi Arabia. His family hadn't heard from him since the invasion. I was just nervous, but now I'm so happy. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's what we've been waiting for, really. It's yes. really super. In spite of the dangers facing the 4,000 Britons left behind, Peter Bunting believes others will inevitably try to escape. I'm sure they will, because the situation is getting worse. Not better. Police hunting the killer of a 48-year-old man say the murderer may have been spotted running from the scene by two couples. Brian Adams, a glass worker, was shot dead outside his home in Thorndyke Avenue at Alveston in Derby on Tuesday night. Police were called to the scene after neighbours heard gunshots. Detectives say it's possible two couples walking along the road at the time may have seen the killer running away. Police have appealed to them to come forward. Final safety checks have been made in preparation for tomorrow's Monsters of Rock Festival at Donington in Leicestershire. Two years ago, two people died in a crash at the concert. This report from Barrett Patel. Two deaths, Coroner Philip Tomlinson recommended a series of safety measures. The slope which helped to push the crowd forward is gone. Some areas have been sanded to stop people slipping. A huge screen has been installed so people don't try to push forward to see the bands on stage. Video cameras will monitor the crowd. 12 doctors, 11 paramedics, 16 ambulances, 10 nurses and 100 St John ambulance staff will be on standby. A costume museum has been presented with two prize exhibits today. Ice stars Torville and Dean handed over their famous bolero outfits for display. The couple delighted audiences around the world with their bolero routine. But it's the purple costumes that are remembered just as much as their gold.